My pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Troy E. Smith as our David O. McKay lecturer today. Dr. Smith is a professor of political science at BYU-Hawaii. He's also a fellow at the Center for the Study of Federalism and editor of the online encyclopedia Federalism in America. His extensive works have been published in, uh, by the Oxford University Press the Brookings Institute, Institution, and various scholarly journals. Let me just share with you one uh, quote um, referring to his work in the Oxford University Press. The editor wrote, this is an assured, even mag uh, magisterial entry which covers an immensely complex set of interrelated literatures with ease and lucidity. Federalism in the U.S. is one of the hardest things for anyone to write about and understand. But this really puts it off and opens up the full interest and liveliness of the subfield to any interested reader. Um, Dr. Smith has been a faculty member at BYU-Hawaii since 2005. He is married to Diane Evanson Smith, who is an adjunct in the math department. We would like to present this certificate to uh, Troy, recognizing his time devoted to this year's David O. McKay lecture, and now turn the time over to him. Dr. Smith, if you'll join me up here. We have this uh, certificate recognizing the lecture and also this important envelope that goes with it. Dr. Smith. Vice President Bell, FAC members, faculty, staff, and students of BYU-Hawaii, thank you for this opportunity. It is an honor to be here. The social and political tumult we've witnessed in the United States and around the world this century has people questioning what is happening. Some see a parallel between our internet age and the era following the invention of the Gutenberg Press. Both inventions made it cheap and easy to spread opinions that challenge the ideas that bind a society together and make cooperation and community possible. It's good that ideas are challenged and oppressive ideas give way to better things. But what is better? One answer is found in President McKay's and other inspired leaders' vision that BYU-Hawaii would develop leaders who will foster international peace and respect ethnic and cultural diversity. This is an indeed an ideal to strive towards, but how to accomplish it? And how can we reconcile the seemingly diametrically opposed ideals of unity and diversity? For too much unity can become stifling uniformity and destroy diversity, and too much diversity can detract from common values thereby undermining unity and peace. The social polarization following the Gutenberg Press's invention resulted in the most deadly and destructive war in Europe's history. That war ended with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 that sought to impose peace and unity by consolidating power in sovereign rulers who, being advised by science, would rule society in a top-down manner. Another proposal for peace, adopted by many groups that fled Europe, was to disperse power and base leadership and rule on persuasion, compromise, and consent. These two proposals to create peace and unity exemplify two different types of rule. The first, and most common, is the rule of superiors over subordinates, where power is consolidated in elites who rule over others. The second type is rule shared between free and equal humans, 
Its objective is empowering others to be full partners in society by dispersing and sharing power. This is power to rather than power over. Societies ruled in this manner are called self-governing societies. Anciently, Athens, Rome, and Israel were, for a time, self-governing societies. Each of those ancient societies overthrew tyrants and created political systems without a boss. The systems they created dispersed power between competing institutions that often needed to cooperate to achieve their objectives. These systems worked well until they wanted to rule others or empower superiors. In ancient Athens, citizens took turns ruling and being ruled. The word to rule also meant to begin, to initiate, or to start, emphasizing the initiative to start something and the voluntary response from others to accept it. The antonym of to rule in Greek is dictatorship, which means the person who rules does what he likes without considering anyone else's opinion. The Romans gave us the English word obey, but in Latin the word has two different meanings that correspond with the two different forms of rule. The first is to be subject or serve. The second is to listen to, to pay attention, to give ear. In ancient Hebrew, there are two words for to rule, one for when superiors rule inferiors, which when done among humans is always tyranny. The other rule is between equals. God's relationship with humans is as equals based on consent. In ancient Hebrew, there was no word for obey. And while we often translate shemo as obedience, a more accurate translation would be to hearken, suggesting openness to being persuaded. Some political systems try to combine both types of rule. In ancient Egypt, Pharaoh was superior as a god among men, and the rest of humanity were considered equals. Yet this equality between the people was consistently disrupted by the administrative class claiming special privileges due to their proximity to, to Pharaoh, and this caused numerous civil wars and revolutions. In English, the word to rule implies a strong statist coercive element resembling domination. The connotation is to rule over subordinates. Much of my discipline, political science, prefers the top-down power over model of rule. This form of rule requires identifying the enlightened or meritorious, and this, as in ancient Egypt, leads to unhealthy social divisions. But the problem with power over forms of rule is even more fundamental, because recent scientific findings suggest that human flourishing, unity, and diversity does better under shared rule that disperses power and fosters bottom-up governance. My discipline, political science, as its name declares, considers itself a science. Science began with the promise that it would free humans from anxiety, want, and bondage by helping humans understand and control nature. This claim is based on the idea that our cosmos is like a physical mechanism, like a clock, that humans can observe, understand, and manipulate to their benefit. Given that premise, good governance resembles engineering, designed by experts using the latest science, run by an int integrated bureaucratic apparatus, and led by the best leaders who rule through centralized structures with top-down control. A name for this type of rule is statism. Many modern liberal democracies, totalitarian governments, and political scientists favor statism. Indeed, modern democracies are increasingly about choosing which leaders will wield the tools of government rather than limiting government and sharing rule. When it comes to fostering unity and diversity, statism's record is not good. Many statists hope to achieve an idealistic society through state-imposed unity. They emphasize the community and view individuals as mere components and replaceable ones at that. Consequently, when these idealistic governments find utopia harder to achieve than expected, they often result, resort 
to mass killings to eliminate the non-compliant, disobedient individuals. Thus, the French Jacobins killed 10,000, and communist nations in the 20th century killed around 100 million. The effort to achieve an idealized unity through statism often obliterates difference and diversity. Statism in other places, like the United States, favors excessive individualism. Here, emphasis is placed on individual authenticity with little regard for community needs, natural ends, or higher truths. The individual is presumed to have a unique core of feeling and intuition that needs to be expressed if individuality is to be realized. Thus, morality for each individual comes entirely from within themselves, with each hearkening only to their own mind and will, and each capable of choosing their own commitments and roles they will play. Government's role in such a system is twofold. First, neutrality, that is to take no sides in moral disputes. And second, to remove any obstacles to the expressive individual, which often means shifting responsibility from individuals to government. The result is not neutrality, but moral relativism that proclaims no one has the authority to criticize, and it is my feelings, my truth, my choice that supersedes all other claims of right, good, or truth. The consequence is a breakdown of communities and social relations, divisiveness, and increasingly individual loneliness. In short, excessive individualism generates broad diversity but undermines unity. Whether building idealistic societies or advancing individualism, statism fails to achieve its promises. Some claim this is because politics prevails over science. However, political science has yet to discover anything that can be considered a scientific law. The political pundits who fill our airwaves and social media with their enlightened opinions are correct only slightly more often than random. Examples of political science's failures include the failure to predict Trump's success, Brexit, the rise of terrorism, the Arab Spring, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the end of the Cold War. Its bad policy history includes McNamara's management of Vietnam and other proxy wars, transforming former communist countries into kleptocracies, and the war on poverty and healthcare policies. Political science's ontology and epistemology are excessively conservative, dismissing abductive reasoning and restricting acceptable scientific findings to reductive deductions, regularized inductions, or refined techniques. If the political science of today was, was present when the U.S. Constitution was proposed in 1787, political, soci political scientists would have either abstained from the constitutional debates or recommended monarchy as the best form of government. Political science is not without insight or success, but most of that has little bearing on improving politics or policy. policy. And the regularity it relies on is always suspect. Consequently, political science is increasingly irrelevant to addressing actual political problems. Fortunately, new scientific findings point to a new foundation for political science and all the social sciences. These new findings come from complexity science, which studies chaotic and complex systems where change is caused by feedback loops within the system. In contrast, the standard science model presumes a mechanical universe where change is exogenous. One of the amazing features to come out of the study of complex systems is the concept of emergence, which occurs when the macro characteristics are unrelated to its component elements. For example, water's slippery wetness is an emergent property not found in oxygen, hydrogen, or even a few molecules of water. Emergence violates the standard science model's assumptions of reductionism, which claims that the whole is the sum of its parts. In the social world, emergence often occurs when individuals follow a few simple rules, causing complex, unplanned order. 
For example, near the end of the 20th century, we had no idea how fish school or birds flock. Emergence suggested that a few simple rules might explain their complex behavior. We can now simulate this. In this computer simulation, each individual triangle, called a void, begins with no rules, and their flight patterns are consequently random. If we add three simple rules, fly towards others, match velocity, don't get too close, we see an emergent order that resembles flocking. If we add obstacles, the red dots, the voids adapt to sustain flocking. This small example shows how simple rules can create complex order that vastly exceeds anything expected from its component parts. Another example. Wolf packs are incredibly effective hunters because they appear to follow two simple rules. Get as close to the prey as possible without getting injured or killed and move away from your closest hunting companion. The alpha male does not direct or control his pack on the hunt. Rather, each individual wolf, perhaps following an instinct similar to these two general rules, helps create an emergent order that results in an incredibly effective hunting group that easily adapts to a varied landscape. Today, engineers design emergence into their projects. Take, for example, this intersection from Point in England, which has no traffic signs or signals. It was designed to instill situational awareness and foster nonverbal communication between drivers, bikers, and pedestrians. Consequently, traffic flows more efficiently and the number of accidents and fatalities is significantly less than when the intersection had traffic signs and signals. Martin Cassini calls streets like these quality streets because order emerges from intuited rules of fairness that all humans share. Similar intersections and streets have been built around the world with similar results. One important takeaway from this is that simple rules in the right environment or conditions can lead to emergent, complex, spontaneous order. Like birds or wolves, humans possess some innate senses or internal rules that, while not determinative, do make society and cooperation possible. What are these innate senses or internal rules that humans possess and which transcend culture? At a minimum, humans have an innate moral sense based on reciprocity and proportionality. They have a sense of logic and a desire for truth. Evidence for this proposition is strong. A litany of findings demonstrate that humans are not simply self-interested beings, but innately moral, reasonable beings. For example, how people define corrupt is fairly stable across cultures and time. And even those in severely corrupt systems do not internalize corrupt practices as morally legitimate. At the same time, human nature also includes elements that favor tribalism and rebellion. These are not always bad impulses because what is right and proper is often context dependent, giving place for reason and deliberation to determine the appropriate response. These new scientific findings do suggest do, um, two important conclusions. First, the standard scientific model based on a mechanical universe misunderstands much of our universe. That model explains how billiard balls move and crystals form, but humans are neither billiard balls nor crystals. Our interactions are best understood not as pieces in a mechanical universe, but as a, as a complex system. Second, an anthropology that ignores the innate moral sense humans possess and reduces human be beliefs and behavior to either deterministic drives or constructed culture are likewise inadequate for understanding and explaining humans and human society. Let me give some examples. One of the strange results of emergence is that the resulting macro order is often counterintuitive. Consider the following two pictures. Can you identify which society rep represented in the pictures is the more racist? These pictures depict two groups of people, blue and orange, who are free to move where they desire. The white squares are unoccupied spaces. In one picture, the households prefer living in an immediate neighborhood where 30% of their neighbors look like them. 
In the other picture, the households want 80% of their neighbors to look like them. Each blue and orange household moves if its immediate neighborhood has more of the opposite color than they prefer. These pictures show what results over time. So which society is more racist and which is more tolerant? Most would say that society A has the most racist because we see clear lines of segregation between the colors. Society B, it would seem, has less racism because the colors appear integrated. Actually, society A is the least racist. Households there want 30% of their neighbors to look like them. 30% isn't a lot of racism, but it does result in segregated neighborhoods. Consider this picture, where households want neighbors 70% like them. Segregation is extensive. In a mechanical universe, any increases above 70% would follow a linear progression of segregation. However, something strange happens between 70 and 80%. In society B, where households want 80% of their neighbors to look like them, the society looks integrated, but is actually chaotic, that is highly disordered, because the people keep moving trying to find neighborhoods that satisfy their desires. I'm not saying racism does not exist or is not a problem. My point is that complex systems behave very different from mechanical models. In complex systems, what appears at the macro level can be radically different from micro characteristics and behaviors. Let me turn to anthropology or our understanding of human nature. Political science has a founding myth, the tragedy of the commons. This metaphor claims that humans are self-interested and consequently will exploit common resources to extinction if individuals are left to rule themselves. The tragedy of the commons assumes that people are so individualistic and self-seeking that they cannot see past their immediate self-interest to consider and solve collective action problems. The solution we political scientists like to claim is government that steps in, creates, and enforces order via laws imposed upon those self-seeking individuals. Outside of textbooks and laboratories, however, the tragedy of the commons is quite rare. When found in the real world, the tragedy of the commons is almost always caused by government intervention. Scholars who've left the laboratory and ventured into the real world have found many examples of humans acting cooperatively without government oversight or guidance. One of the pioneers of this work is Eleanor Ostrom, the only political scientist to receive a Nobel Prize. Ostrom found examples of humans across the world solving collective action problems without government assistance by devising, agreeing to, and self-enforcing a few simple rules. This happens, for example, in the mountain and alpine ecosystems of Japan and Switzerland, with irrigation systems in Spain and the Philippines, and inshore fisheries in Turkey and Maine. Ostrom found that the result of a few simple rules and a binding agreement among humans can produce an emergent, complex order that is far more than the sum of its parts. She called these spontaneous orders because they emerge bottom up, in contrast to order that is imposed top down. In other words, contrary to the tragedy of the commons conclusion, self-government exists and thrives in the real world. Ostrom's findings present two big takeaways. First, much of our politics and culture are influenced by inaccurate theories that reinforce self-interested, individualistic emotivism and centralized top-down government. A few common examples include Darwinism's claims that life is an accident and humans are just animals with no purpose, meaning, or free will. Marxism's claims that materialistic forces more than human choice drives human history and determines the world. Freud's claim that humans cannot master their own desires, and Bentham's argument that humans are organized around pleasure and pain rather than truth, morality, and meaning. Each of these theories comes from the standard science model's mechanical universe, and each faces serious scientific challenges if not rejected by their respective fields. The second big takeaway is that human communities may emerge and create spontaneous orders from simple rules under the right conditions. These spontaneous orders may be beneficial or harmful. 
To prevent harm, some favor rule by superiors or subordinate, over subordinates or top-down governance. Others, however, argue that rule can be shared between free and equal people if we get the rules and conditions right. The natural question that now arises is, what simple rules and conditions will foster flourishing human societies and encourage peace, unity, and diversity? First, there's no scientific formula because complex systems defy precise prediction. That is, complex systems are non-reductive and non-linear, which means inputs will have unexpected and disproportionate consequences on the system. Instead of rational planning to achieve some idealistic end, which will ultimately fail, the objective is to first do no harm, then maximize freedom and accountability. This allows individuals and groups, even non-experts, to experiment and learn what works and what doesn't. For freedom to be productive, however, there must be rules. There will always be people who will use their agency to harm others. Because while a moral sense may be natural, moral and virtuous behavior is not. Government is necessary to provide security and foster individual and social welfare. That is, rule by a free and equal people or self-government entails rules and accountability. These rules are general statements that guide behavior while allowing individuals and groups to act on their own knowledge. The rules should create the conditions that allow an orderly arrangement to emerge, not impose a preconceived order. At a minimum, these rules should protect criticism, competition, and feedback. Each society must develop its own rules and institution consistent with its values and environment. Getting those rules and institutions right for self-government is very difficult and requires much time and conflict. It requires persuasive discourse with proposals and counterproposals, dissensions, negotiations, compromise, flexibility, and forgiveness. And once the goals are identified and rules established, the respect for diversity and freedom means that there will be ongoing disagreements about what is to be done. Self-governing societies do not prevent conflict. Rather, they channel it into institutions that prevent domination and foster persuasive discourse between individuals or groups who are committed to the success of the collective enterprise. This requires individuals with the virtues required for self-governance, which includes the ability to make and keep promises, to think carefully of how to apply the shared values and general rules to specific situations, to negotiate and compromise, and to tolerate differing perspectives that are consistent with the agreed upon values. If we desire to create such a system, especially one that seeks to balance unity and diversity, then Athenian democracy is probably not the best example because it did not protect individual liberty and it does not scale. The ancient Republic of Israel, I think, provides a better model. That system united a people around some basic rules accepted by covenant. It protects diversity by limiting unity to the covenant thus preserving space for individual separateness and distinctiveness. The covenant model also scales well. Covenantal rule is the rule of equals. Remember in Hebrew, any superior subordinate relationship among humans is tyranny. Even God's relationship with humans is as an equal. He agrees to constrain his power in order to protect human freedom. In such a system, while institutions are important, the essence of the system is the attitude, spirit, and culture it creates. Thus, covenantal rule is based on genuine persuasion rather than command. This requires genuine listening, persuasive discourse, deliberation, negotiation, and compromise. The expectation is that all hearkening and negotiating is done in good faith, consistent with the covenant. Covenants are not contracts. Both entail commitment and mutual promises, but contracts maximize individualism while covenants form us into social beings. A covenant takes two or more eyes and creates something new, 
a we. It creates a new entity, a coming together to form an us with a binding, lasting commitment to the success of this new unity. Contracts, on the other hand, end when the contract's terms are fulfilled. The parties separate, each has something they want, but the contract has not changed them. Also, contracts are written in excessive detail, allowing each to fulfill the contract by doing the bare minimum. Covenants are written in general terms, granting each party the discretion to determine what the covenant requires of them in a given context, but with the expectation that each party is fully committed to the success of the collective us. Covenants create simple rules that order relationships from which complex, spontaneous social order may emerge. By providing the uniting, founding, defining terms for a new, enduring entity, covenants form its participants and their society. In this way, covenants define a culture rather than being downstream of a culture. Covenants also scale well. Because they are limited rather than all-encompassing or totalitarian, they preserve space for individual diversity and liberty. Within that space, individuals may enter into other covenants, creating new entities, as long as the original entities are not harmed. The result is a nested system of entities representing multiple perspectives. When the covenant model is applied to political systems, the result is multiple governments with overlapping political powers and responsibilities. This is often known as federalism. This allows cooperation and competition between governments. To those who prefer top-down centralized rule, this duplication appears messy, unnecessary, and inefficient. But from a complexity perspective, the overlapping and competition creates a robust and dynamic system. Now, a dangerous tendency of covenant groups is tribalism and favoritism. When a covenant society views itself as distinct and chosen, it may choose to separate itself from others and thereby become tribalistic. Favoritism develops within the group from the idea that success comes from keeping the covenant. Thus, the successful may feel their privileges are merited and they are privileged by God. Ancient Israel countered these problems by requiring hospitality to strangers and rules that redistributed economic wealth. When the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1788, its first words, we the people, appealed to the philosophy of covenant and self-government that Americans had been experimenting with for 170 years since the Mayflower landed at Plymouth in 1620. The Constitution creates a federal system of government. Federal comes from the Latin word feudus, which means treaty, pact, or covenant. That federal system separates powers across and between governments as a means to balance shared rule and self-rule, community and liberty, unity and diversity. The ideal of a strong unity of limited scope to protect diversity is expressed in America's motto, e pluribus unum, from the many, one. America hasn't always lived up to that ideal, but that moral ideal is rooted in America's history, written into its founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and restated in its important speeches like the Gettysburg Address. When America transgresses that ideal and restricts the liberties and diversity of others, that ideal stands in judgment and as a corrective against those actions. Following the Civil War, intellectuals influenced by European ideas of government and Darwin's ideas of evolution adopted ideas contrary to federal governance. From the Europeans, many American intellectuals learned to favor the centralization of power and rule by experts and elites. From Darwin, they adopted a belief that man is not a transcendent being whose thoughts and soul transcend matter, but rather a material accident whose ideas can aspire not to truth, but to little more than being useful. Thus, the statist model of top-down rule was slowly integrated into America. Today, statism and federalism inform 
two very different interpretations of the U.S. Constitution. What is the performance record of these two forms of rule? The statist model seeks unity and peace by consolidating power to scientifically manage the economy and society. Superiors rule over subordinates with complicated and extensive rules. This model assumes that objectivity is possible, that leaders are sufficiently intelligent to comprehend and solve the leading issues and problems of their day, and that leaders can marshal an army of bureaucrats to fairly and judiciously administer the leader's dictates without corruption or undermining the political arrangement. These are, however, impossible expectations. Objectivity in politics ignores politics' very nature and purpose, which is based in values. The dynamic emergent nature of living things means they defy precise prediction. Moreover, the nature of information impairs effective centralized rule because moving information away from where it is produced always entails degradation. Hence, each layer of bureaucracy erodes information. This means that rulers often lack key information, and uniform rules, laws, and policies cannot cover all possible contingencies. Consequently, managers and bureaucrats responsible for implementing and enforcing the laws face impossible and unworkable scenarios. They respond in different ways, with a strict and restrictive interpretation of the rules, wisdom that seeks to balance competing values, lax enforcement, or dishonesty and corruption. Corruption is often not an individual choice, but a social consequence resulting from bad policies. Consolidating power in experts and elites also grants powerful interest groups easier access to lawmakers while making it more difficult for less organized and distant groups to communicate their ideas and concerns. And public officials often reject local solutions simply because they view them as unofficial, non-scientific. The result is often bad policies and popular contempt for the government and its laws. The mainstream of political science claims that the consolidation and centralization of power improves public services. The evidence, however, shows that federal and decentralized political systems generally provide more efficient human services, have less corruption, are more innovative, and provide more and better opportunities for public participation in shaping the laws that govern them. At the municipal level, centralized city administrations provide the worst services whereas fragmented, overlapping, and small jurisdictions offer better human services at a lower cost. That is, by dispersing power, federalism shifts some powers closer to the people, which means less distance for information to travel and positive competition between governments. The U.S. military and many businesses, such as Toyota, have found great success shifting from a top-down, power over form of rule to a decentralized bottom up power to form of rule. Statism places scientific experts atop the pantheon of right thinking. It should thus be no surprise that people increasingly try to silence debate or avoid the trouble of thinking by claiming they are on the side of science. When the issue actually calls for prudential or moral reasoning that all, including non-scientists, are qualified to argue over. Status governments promise to protect individual rights and foster authenticity by consolidating responsibility in distant institutions ruled by elites and powerful interest. But it is our embrace of those responsibilities that connect us to purposes greater than self, that cultivate the character and virtues necessary for self-governments and collaborative work with others. Without committed relations and connections that bind us to others, we are less secure and fall easier for group identities and extreme ideologies. Now, I'm not saying that science is bad or common sense can completely replace experts. I'm proposing that a more realistic science that recognizes complexity would recognize political science's limitations. Complexity science asserts that the tools of political science are insufficiently precise to make the type of predictions common in some of the natural sciences. And a more realistic understanding of humans would respect humans' moral and common sense, 
and work with human values to build a system that addresses our deepest human questions and our most important aspirations. To conclude, there are many forms of government, but only two forms of rule. The first is rule by superiors over subordinates in a top-down manner that requires extensive rules and a government of broad scope. The second is the rule of a free and equal people that shares power, pulls people into partnerships, and rules based on genuine persuasion, compromise, and consent. In 1835, a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, visited America. He warned that America's democracy and self-government would not be destroyed by foreign powers conquering America but by Americans giving up their independence to a powerful centralized government that promised to make their lives easier by assuming their responsibilities. Tocqueville called this soft tyranny and predicted it would be the natural thing. Sustaining individual independence and local liberties, he said, is an art that requires thoughtful and conscientious cultivation. His prediction has not only proven prescient but also an ongoing warning. The art of self-government is very old, hearkening back to the democracies and republics of Athens, Rome, and Israel. Israel's covenant form of rule, adapted by America's founders, provides a means for unity through shared rule and diversity through self-rule. The standard science model largely dismisses these ways, yet new scientific findings reveal the limits and problems of centralizing power and ruling from the top. And complexity science and emergence confirm the ancient understanding that from simple rules and virtuous citizens can emerge self-governing societies of unity and diversity. These societies not only survive, but also flourish. President McKay's vision for BYU-Hawaii invites us to think carefully about the type of rule that will foster peace, unity, and diversity, and the qualities and characteristics we need to develop to make that happen. Thank you.